Welcome to the National Gallery. I'm Rusty Powell, uh, director of the gallery. Uh, it has been the gallery's pleasure to be associated with the Foundation for Art and Preservation in, in embassies for uh, many years now, and we have always enjoyed and, and uh, honored the, the relationship. And we appreciate this opportunity to present today's distinguished program. We are honored to welcome distinguished architect Frank Gehry and Paul Goldberger, architecture critic and author. Uh, their conversation today will be moderated by Harry Cooper, our own curator and head of modern art at the National Gallery. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Harry and welcome you again to the National Gallery. And uh, please enjoy. Okay. Rationalists wearing square hats think in square rooms, looking at the floor, looking at the ceiling. They confine themselves to right-angled triangles. If they tried rhomboids, cones, waving lines, ellipses, as for example the ellipse of the half moon, rationalists would wear sombreros. Wallace Stevens, Six Significant Landscapes, written in 1916 and uh, realized um, by many of the buildings that, uh, that we're going to talk about and uh, maybe look at. Sure. So, um, so my first and perhaps last question uh, will be how did this all come about, your relationship uh, for many decades and, uh, and now sure. this great book. Uh, how did Wallace Stevens come about, or how did the larger, larger thing? Okay, right, right. Um, actually, we first met Frank in Washington, so there's sort of an appropriateness to doing yeah. this here, right? Right? Because it was yeah. the um, he was just a little kid. It's true. <laughs> you were you weren't so old oh. yourself. It's, a, uh, it's true. I was a little kid, and I was a very young writer for the New York Times, and uh, I was at the AIA convention, which that year was in Washington. And uh, there was uh, a reception outdoors on the lawn of the AIA headquarters, which is over across from the Corcoran. And uh, uh, I was talking to my colleague at the New York Times, Aidan Louise Huxtable. And this man walks over and uh, recognized Aidan Louise, who was, of course, quite prominent in the world of architecture criticism. In fact, she was architecture criticism uh, in the way that as uh, somebody once was asked about Irving Berlin's position in American music and said Irving Berlin was American music. Well, Ada Louise Huxtable was architecture criticism. And Frank came over and started talking to him, and then I was there, so he was polite and started talking to me as well. And we haven't stopped. That's the short answer, right? Right. Said, right. The long answer is the book, I suppose, <laughs> which um, uh, began... Uh, five, five plus, five and a half, six years ago, actually, when I was asked by Alfred Knopf, the publisher, if I would consider writing a biography of Frank Gehry, and uh, I said I would be happy to if he cooperates, but accepts the <coughs> condition that most people wouldn't accept, which is that he has no control over the uh, contents. And Frank, to my astonishment, said, okay. And so, there we are. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> Damned if we, we aren't. Uh, so I had been asked by several people by then about doing a biography, and I, I was terrified of it and didn't want to go near it. And uh, an autobiography, you mean? Uh, autobiography. Yeah. Right. Right. No. Yeah. But. Then we got to biography right, after okay. I refused that. Right. And then there were numerous people being discussed and brought forward. And um, I thought, I love him. <laughs> I trust him. Uh, he has his own mind, his own values. Uh, he's not afraid to 
be critical of me. He's not afraid that he will lose me as a friend if he says the truth. And so I figured it was the perfect fit. And I didn't bother you. No, no, you, you were great. I see. I mean, um, you know, people said to me, how can you write a biography of a living person? It must be a nightmare because you're so, you have to tiptoe around everything. Um, I mean, obviously, you knew that I, because I'd written enough about you over the years, you knew that I fundamentally liked your work, even if we might have differed here and there about specific things. You know, I, I, I believed in your body of work as a, as a whole and what you were doing. Um, and I think it would be an awful lot of trouble to take on a four or five year project like this, the, the sole purpose of which would be to prove what a terrible architect you are. So, uh, so you know, there, there was, but, uh, no, but within, over, within over. the framework of generally positive, I needed the freedom to be able to say right. what, I, what I wanted. But I knew and, there were things I had done that you were right. quest questioning. And right. And I, was, I was questioning even more. <laughs> but for me, um, the most, the, the biggest challenge, in a way, was not really the architecture, because I'd been thinking about your architecture for 40 years, uh, since the fateful day at the AIA headquarters when we um, <clears throat> tried to slip out of that boring party and, and talk. Um, it, it was about the, everything else, about the rest of life, because I, I've spent my life writing about people's work. I had never written about someone's life before, and it's a very different kind of challenge. And figuring out how the two work together, um, connecting them where appropriate, but also I think recognizing that they're not always completely connected. That it's not like sort of like Rosebud in, in Citizen Kane. You know, there's not one simple little thing that absolutely explains everything. And there are plenty of things you've done that have had nothing to do with your work, or at least have not had a direct impact on it, but weaving together those two things. Um, so uh, actually, people said there were two, two things I was told. Um, why would you ever be so crazy as to write a biography of a living subject? One of them was about tiptoeing and not offending, which, as I said, I think we did OK there. Um, and the other I was not prepared for, which was um, how difficult it is to structure a biography of a living person because, in fact, you need to give it a good ending. And since you, you, didn't, you did not come along with the, you know, with one way to end a book, you're still here. <laughs> so um, I, I, I'm glad that you didn't solve that problem for me that way. Yeah. So um, I had to think of another way. In the particular case here, um, I used the opening of the Fondation Louis Vuitton in Paris at the end of 2014, because that was kind of a big event. And uh, um, yes, actually, if we can get it on the screen, there it is. Um, the, uh, <coughs> that was an extraordinary event. It was opened by the president of France. There were days of celebrations. It was, uh, and the building itself was a long and complex saga that took a decade. So all of that made a wonderful ending to the book. But I've lived a whole life since then. <laughs> you're, ju you're just trying to get me to sign on for volume two. That's all. <laughs> Absolutely. That, I, I, I see what your, what your uh, yeah. motive is here. That's uh, actually, we, uh, we'll see. Keep going. We'll talk about it. But, <laughs> uh, but well, actually, let's talk about that, though, because in fact, um, since people can read the book and learn about Fondation Louis Vuitton and everything before it, and a lot of those buildings like the Guggenheim and Bilbao are very familiar, um, maybe it would be fun to talk for a moment about some of the new stuff you're doing because it actually is somewhat different, hmm. actually. I mean, the LA River, for example. Which for example. Is, <laughs> which LA River is very different from so all the, this stuff, right? The LA River is 51 miles long. It has 15 uh, political constituencies. Uh, all of the cities south of LA are mostly Latino. And um, 
a lot of effort has been spent on the river north of the city and a lot less time south. The um, health uh, statistics of people living along the river are appalling by um, diabetes B and obesity and all of that stuff because kids have no access to open space. Um, our mayor called me and said, hey Frank, you know New York has this high line thing uh, and they're making a lot of hay out of it and we've got this river, can't you help me make it at least as important as the high line? And I looked into the phone and I said, yeah, but the High Line is a derelict uh, railroad bridge. And, and, you, and, and it's a mile long as and opposed you can, to 51 you miles can, You can plant it or you can kick right. it, it doesn't matter. The river is a, a flood control project and it's, it has its own mandate, its own requirements. So they were willing to give me the time to, which I volunteered for, this is a, a volunteer kind of effort on my part. And it's, I thought it would be 10% of my time. It's now mm -hmm. closer to 50% of my time. Mm -hmm. And the office is getting pissed at me, but, <laughs> um, but it's like a disease. Once you get it here, <laughs> um, the, the river, uh, a billion gallons a year goes through the river to the, to the ocean and LA is drought ridden, so we need that. We need right, to right. keep that water and put it in the aquifer. And there's difficulties to do that. How you do it, how you clean it, and how much it costs, and then how much gain there is. And there's a net gain, so it's it's on the plus plus side mm -hmm. if you do it right. Uh, there's a plus side on the health side if you do it right. Uh, there's a plus side on just the livability in the city of LA having that kind of thing. We're used to the ocean and the mountains and the desert. We got all of that out there, but we don't have a bloody river like this. And, um, and if you take a map of the basin, the, the LA basin, it's filled with little rivulets and all of them have water at various mm -hmm. times of the year. And if you connected all those dots with green space, LA could be a whole different city. So it, it's a pretty staggering, but uh, exciting thing yeah, to, right. to get into. Would you say it's more, I mean, the LA River now, we should remind people who don't know it, is essentially a, a concrete culvert. Right. right, right. It's not. Doesn't look like. So the, does not look like the Potomac. It, it, it's well, if you saw the movie right. Chinatown, right, it's right. like there. Um, and there's a lot of effort to get rid of that. Right, right. Concrete, but you can't because at the two percent of the time where the river is using itself as a flood control project, it needs those banks. Right, right. And so you can't plant in it mm -hmm. because those 2% of the time, the trees would be gone. Right. If you widen the, on either side and mm -hmm. cut the concrete in half and then put it up on top, you can, you can modulate it so that it's not as forceful when mm -hmm. it's at the 2% of the time and you can put trees in it. So there's solutions like that that we're discovering. We brought in, uh, people from Holland. What they do in Holland is on the banks of, of the canals, they, they have diff three levels and they build parks on the three, identical parks, mm -hmm. the first level, second level, and third. So when it's, it's low, the park is here and you mm -hmm. got benches. When it comes up to that level, that you use the benches on the next level, they're mm -hmm. identical. So mm -hmm. you don't know that you're... <laughs> And then you go to the third level. So they, they solved it, but they've been very helpful with us with uh, all the experts you can find in hydrology. And, and uh, right. it's pretty exciting. I got Laurie Olin, who you know. Yeah, sure, uh, landscape architect. Landscape architect yeah. um, to help me. And, well, uh, is it fundamentally a hydrology project, a landscape project, 
an urban design project? Everything. A political and social project? Poli I mean, political right. and social had been ignored. Right. And we went out and got all of those mayors and people involved. Mm -hmm. And that's helped a lot. So you've actually acted almost like a convener of all yeah. these different groups. I even got Jerry Brown's attention for two minutes. <laughs> okay. And uh, he, I mean, it took him two minutes. And then after that, I didn't know whether he got it or not. But the week next, he sent me all his cabinets, people, all they started mm -hmm. coming. Uh, he's been very helpful. Uh, the local mayors have been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a few that don't want to be involved because they're, I, I would say there's some kind of stuff going on that they don't want people to know about, maybe. Um, but we're getting to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Great. Good. Can I sidetrack us for a minute? Yeah. This uh, lovely <clears throat> anecdote about the uh, three parks. It's going on and off, too. Um, just reminded me of a couple of pages in the book where you, Paul, bring out Frank's notion that architecture is an art of illusion. Um, and uh, I don't know if it's an illusion that we're not in the park we used to be in, but um, I'd like to hear more about that because it's sort of counterintuitive. That architecture is an art? A an art of illusion. Oh. I'd rather talk about whether architecture is an art. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. <clears throat> I mean, no, no more appropriate place to have that conversation than here, right? So um, Giotto was a painter, and then he became an architect, right? Yeah. And um, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, and I can't remember the names, but... Bernini? Bernini, but there was a lot of them. and. So architect, you start out as an artist, and you graduate as an architect. So that's, that's history. I can't help it. I didn't. <clears throat> that's all you have to say on the subject, I guess, right? <laughs> is that, um, well, <laughs> well, I'm not just a plumber, as Mr. Sarah called me. And the, the, the book is called Building Art. The book, the book is, is called, called Building, Building Art. Building so that's Art. Your, your fault, right? It's, no, I, I actually love that title because, in fact, well, first, because it's, it's a slight wordplay. You know, it's... Uh, and The that, art of building. The art of building, but also constructing art, creating art in a, in a way, yes. Um, but the point I tried to make in the book, which uh, I think you would agree with, is that the idiocy of this either-or construction. I mean, why is something either? <laughs> Uh, a practical pursuit or an art? And why is it viewed as a zero-sum game? Why does it have to be uh, argued that, you know, as, as you once said, I think it, you're quoted in the book, if I remember correctly, you know, people think because it has toilets in it, it can't be art. Um, well, Duchamp would have known better anyway, but, <laughs> but even, even so, um, putting that aside, um, you know, that, that why cannot something fulfill a practical function and also elevate us as art does? I don't, don't get the either or. Well, but. I think uh, that the Greeks did, I mean, I, once I stood in front of the charioteer 500 <laughs> BC right. in Delphi about 45 years ago, and and I started crying, and I wondered how this artist, artist unknown, could make me cry so far in, in the future. And I thought, that's what all of us should be doing, is we're working with inert materials, mm -hmm. and we're, we're creating a, an emotional response of some kind. You can call it whatever you want, artist, architect, I don't, I don't really care. I think uh, Architecture has been uh, put in in other categories because it's in the building industry. It's right. in the uh, in, and so there's a whole different world. And most of our cities are built with that kind of building. And right. And so they're not thought of as uh, 
trying to make feeling with inert materials. They're trying to just get by with making space for or, for whatever. Or right, or with or, no no sense yeah. about what people are going to feel like in them or whatever. And um, so I don't. I think you're talking about different worlds of of, of involvement. I think. Uh, but we, but we have emotional relationships to buildings no matter what, right? right? Even, even the most ordinary building affects us emotionally. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, I, if you're staying in a hotel, it may not be a great work of architecture, but I bet you there are things that make you like or not like where you are, right? Yep. And so... Um, so all I'm saying yep. is we, we all deserve better right. or the best, right? Mm -hmm. And we do it, uh, and it can be done, and... Uh, the same cost to build one of those buildings that's just a building, mm -hmm. you can build architecture. You can. Always? Nobody believes it, but you can. Okay. Guaranteed. <clears throat> I, I defy anybody to tell me otherwise. I, what about the building we're in now? <laughs> well, <laughs> that, I am paid at it. Yes, oh, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> It was not a modest building, however. No, but no. Uh, yeah. Bilbao was built for 300 bucks a square foot. Right. So, and it's three and a half billion dollars in revenue to the city. So, since it opened, but right, right, right. And, Actually, we just, and Jeff Koons. Jeff Koons uh, sculpture I was in the previous asked, image. I was asked yeah. where to put it, and I put it in front because I love Jeff and I love his work. Actually, if we can see the previous image that shows the the Koons in front of the in front of the museum. Uh, there, there. Is. yes, yes, there we are. Exactly. And it's a perfect place, right? Mm -hmm. Jeff. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, it's, it's <clears throat> not going anywhere, as the museum is not, not going anywhere. While we're, since you brought up Bilbao, let's talk about that for a minute, because the whole question of spaces for the display of art, um, and the, another, uh, oh boy, that's a can of worms. Well, but let's uh, let's open the can. We have we have we have time to let a few worms go crawl around for a minute or two. It's okay. Um, the you, know, you and many other architects are often uh, accused of being indifferent to the needs of art by not creating uh, plain, neutral, boxy spaces. Um, I think first, neutrality is a myth in a way, because I don't think e a, a pure white box is not neutral. It's also making a different kind of aesthetic Well, when I statement, finished right? Bilbao, I never yeah. got another museum for a long time. <laughs> and do you, think, do you think that's because of this, this belief? And if it's wrong, explain why it's wrong. Oy vey. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, um, I mean, you love art, and you, you came up through the art world in Los Angeles in the 60s. You've been deeply involved with art and artists your entire life, more than most architects. So it's hard to believe that you would have intentionally created a space hostile to them. Right. And you, you didn't. You did not want to. So what are they missing when they say, or what are the people who didn't hire you for other museums after Bilbao uh, failing to get? Let me, let me put the question that way. Um, well, the presumption is because there was shape in the galleries that they right. were antithetical there. Right. Uh, Tom Krenz, my genius client at the time, asked me to do uh, rectilinear galleries for dead artists mm -hmm. and uh, galleries that I, I would do with uh, form for artists that were alive, okay. so that it would provoke a response. And so Saul LeWitt came in and took on one of the galleries mm -hmm. and made a beautiful piece with it. Kiefer did a beautiful piece with it. Um, many, I mean, Jeff put the thing in front. Right. Uh, there was, uh, uh, I, I never got from anybody, any of the artists, even Helen Frankenthaler, who wasn't a great, had a, knew me or didn't care about me or didn't mm -hmm. even care about my work and probably wanted a rec, regular, she 
told me how great it was. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Cy Twombly, who had many shows before he died, uh, never avoid, did avoid Bill Bow. I was told. Now, I don't know how true this is. And then finally he showed there and he called me uh, from Bill Bow and said it's the best show he'd ever had. So he loved the museum. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's a something. Yeah, no, I know. A square. I'm not, I'm, right, right. So people have built mm -hmm. buildings with the perfect paradigm, you know. Right, right, right. And they haven't worked. I'm not going to mention gallery names, but, <laughs> <laughs> but right, uh, right. and I think you, it's just not a pro forma, you know, right. that if you put, uh, I forget the artist's name, God, who did the white paintings? Ryman, Ryman. Robert Ryman. Robert. Yeah. yeah. You put those in these, these perfect environments and you lose them. Kind right. Of. I mean, they outperfect each other. They kind of. Uh, uh, Arta Povera looks terrible in those kind of galleries. So, I think it depends. It depends how they're hung. You, I mean, we've done too many shows now in the Renzo buildings in L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, the galleries aren't the greatest. They've got these sawtooth right. roofs that are very overpowering. And you can play with it. You well, you could, basically treat you it can, like a loft space. Yeah, you, you can make the whole it work. thing you, in. Right? You'll, you'll, yeah. I mean, Not to make trouble, but you didn't mention Richard Serra. And that relationship in, in Bill Bow is the You want to know about that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Call him. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I love Richard Serra's work and, and him. And whatever, you know, the sound of one hand clapping, I don't know what, what his well, problem is. Well, it's in the book. You can read it. It's in his problem. But yeah. it's, there's, there's a lot of that in the book. Uh, uh, gotta read the book. Right, 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 right. Yeah. It's not a big deal. Well, early on, you certainly influenced each other a great deal, right? And, and communicated a great deal about themes that, that were shared by your work. Let's not say who influenced who, let's just say there were themes and interests that you, you both had in common. Well, I was um, interested in, I mean, like everybody at the time, right after the war, in, in, in minimalism. Mm -hmm. It, it uh, struck a chord with a lot of us. Right. And some artists, could, like the charioteer, mm -hmm. Ellsworth Kelly could do an, a, a minimalist painting and you could cry and in it, front of and it. And it, it became make a, profound, you cry. Profound, uh, a profound thing. Right. right, right and Richard right. Serra, likewise, could put a couple of pieces of steel together and make you feel something. Right. And it was powerful. Yes. So I was attracted to that because it seemed like there was a lot of interest in mm -hmm. that minimalism until uh, Drexler did the Beaux Arts show, and everybody got all excited about how we'd lost this, we'd lost the way to make human human spaces, and the 19th century knew how to do it, and everybody said, "Damn it." Let's go back to the 19th century, and they started. That's postmodern, and it, for better or for worse, it reawakened right. some kind of feeling, and people started to to first copy the Greek temples, and and then find ways to do their own thing with it. But uh, you know, minimalism. Finally, you know, uh, Malevich was a dead end. He, he got to the black square and he couldn't do anything. Uh, so you got to go. Hold on, hold on. I'm gonna, I, I want to come back to that, but let me stop you on that. Zaha Hadid didn't find Malevich a dead end, did she? I don't know. I mean, no, it didn't Zaha do so much that came out of? Yeah. Was out of the inspired by Russian constructivism yeah. and, and pushed it in new directions? But not, a, we, not the minimalism. No, not, not, minimal, not the minimalism part, okay. 
Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, she took it somewhere else, and it was her, her own thing. But let, let, let's go back to that idea of history for a moment, because of course you, you've never um, mimicked history in your work at all, but a lot of your early work, I think, was motivated by some of the same discomfort with the limits of modernism and the yeah. limits of minimalism, and you just, you just, I mean, if I look at some of the things you were writing and saying in the 60s, it isn't that different from what, say, Robert Venturi was writing, or a lot of other people, or Charles Moore in those years, uh, but then the actual work you did pushed it in different directions. Right. But. Well, I, I just didn't like the idea of building Greek temples over right. again. <laughs> right. Um, although I did a few. <laughs> I did play at the edge of it. Right, right. Yeah, that, yeah you did. You and did, in I didn't, fact, play I didn't at the edge. like it. I didn't, right. I didn't right. feel comfortable. So I didn't. Yeah, because there, there's a couple little things. One of the interesting things for me, I have to say, about doing the book, too, was looking in detail at some of the early work, yeah. uh, not all of which is well known, and some of which, you know, you, you had a, a sort of Michael Graves period that might have lasted six months or something, but it was, it was there, and there was a few other things you were playing with. Six weeks. Six I'm weeks, like maybe. <laughs> six days, I don't know, whatever. But, but I mean, you were, you were sort of testing the waters with a lot of the same things a lot of well, I, these people I, were before you then went off in a very different direction. Look, we're all on the planet together, and people are doing interesting things, and mm -hmm. it's exciting to... Um, in the best of all times to share right. ideas with other people uh, and then go your own way with it. You know, you try stuff on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What architects have um, been the most influential to you, do you, do you think? Uh, well, I mean, who, growing up in L.A. as an architect was, certainly was Asia. Right. So. I would say um, Harwell Hamilton Harris mm -hmm. was practicing in L.A. at the time. It was very influenced by Japan. Um, it was easily assimilated into the L.A. tract house mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, culture of building with two by fours, and we could do it. And and there was a model and. Uh, you could do post and beam, and, and it was very inexpensive, mm -hmm. and it did have, it did resonate with people, and uh, there's a lot of it still around in L.A. that built to that period. Um, from there, where did I go? So that brought in Frank Lloyd Wright and right. the Green Brothers and. Mm -hmm. Maybeck and Escherich and right. all of those people. And then Charles Moore took off from there in a totally different direction. Right. I, right. I, uh, I mean, the, he lost me after Sea Ranch. Mm -hmm. He was gone. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, and, you know, doing stuff that was all his own. But uh, so I couldn't. Right. bring myself to go, go that way. I think when, after the army and stuff like that, I went to Harvard to study city planning, and it was there that I ran into the Europeans. Right. The Corb, uh, there was a Corb painting show there that was terrible paintings, but he was working out Ronchamp in the paintings. And if you look at those early paintings that he did, you can see the beginnings right. of Ronchamp, which is one of his finest works. Yes. And which I still pilgrimage to and, and cry like in front of the, the charioteer. I think it, it, he nailed it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and they don't have to be big buildings, right? Mm -hmm. So the one that took knocked my socks off was Mendelssohn. When I was a student, he came to lecture at SC, and he was very arrogant, European, uh, 
didn't like the student questions, so he just went like that. <laughs> um, and so I was t the tendency was not to like him until right. I got to... Until you actually saw his buildings. Until I got to the Einstein Tower, and I dragged you, you to You took me there <laughs> once, yes, right, right. Uh, because if you haven't seen it go, it's in East Berlin, and it's placed it's in, in Potsdam, a actually, just, Potsdam. just outside of Berlin. Yeah. But as you approach it, he not only did a beautiful building on its own, but he placed it in a way that would give you an idea of how to place an object like that in a city. And its relationship to the other buildings was astonishing. And I think when I took you there, you got it in a second. You were just, oh my god. Well, well, what I loved about that was, you know, it, 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 it um, corrects another, I think, misconception about you and your work, yeah. which is that you're just making funny shapes that are dropped like pieces of sculpture, like this glass just plunked on the table. Um, and in fact, you know, the, the Einstein Tower is a very eccentric, unusual shape and you never see a picture of it in context. And then you took me there and we looked at it in the context and you realize that in fact, all of those weird things it's doing have some connection to what's around it. Right. Which is essentially what Bill, we can say about Bilbao as well, right? I mean, the, Bilbao. The tower in New York is closest to a success mm -hmm. in, in that idea right. where the, I don't know if we have a picture of the uh, 8 Spruce Street Tower here. No, we don't. Okay. So the building, I, I did the stair okay. step next to the Woolworth building. Right, right, right. And then the, the curves on it are the same scale as the terracotta uh, uh, panels on the Woolworth building. So they, even though the, the, my curves are bay windows, they're functional, they give you they're something, they're not just decoration. They're in the scale of the other, and, th and then we didn't put a cap on it in deference to the Woolworth building, which has the conical mm -hmm. cap. So the composition with the uh, Brooklyn Bridge, my building, and the, and the Woolworth building, if you look at it the way yeah. I look, it, it's there's a consistent discussion. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're really talking to each other right. in, in, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And like what I saw with Mendelssohn. So. Mm -hmm. right. You mentioned curves, and this is maybe an art historian's question, but was there a moment when you realized you could use all kinds of curved forms? Because your early work has all, all the angles are there and all the projections, but not the curves, if I'm not mistaken. So this, this picture shows the curves. and. Um, I was looking for a way to express movement because I thought that um, 19th century decoration was obsolete. How do you express the time we're in and the movement that everything's moving around you? Right, and right, I right. tried to emulate that in some mm -hmm. way. Uh, that's how I got to the fish lamps and the fish. The fishy story is all about that. Right. But it, it was trying to, the, 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 if you look at the koi fish, they're very architectural, and when they move, uh, it's quite beautiful. So. It's also very complex curves that sort of resolve yeah. themselves into right. a beautiful shape, right? So I was inspired by that, and I started making fish sculptures, shapes, looking at that. And they were very kitsch, and I cut the tail and the head off, and, and try to make them more less kitsch. Anyway, when I got here, we were well into the uh, computer program right. that we used from the French aircraft industry, and we put this building out to bid, and no two pieces of steel are the same. And the steel bidders, six steel bidders came in with a 1% spread, which means the documents are virtually perfect because of everybody's reading the same thing. And they were 18% under budget. So you could trust it. And that's, that was 
Right. That's what I was after. And that's the, soft, that's the software that yeah, made but, that possible. Yeah. But most, if, if you did that to a client, they'd say, I can't afford that, right? Right. So 300 bucks a square foot. I noticed. Uh, and I can't yeah, keep, right. I got to keep saying that because I get yes. told when I usually. It looks I, so expensive. Yeah. When I go to, a, a, I, give, I give talks like this sometimes, not very often anymore, but, and I ask people in the audience, do you think my buildings are expensive? And everybody puts up their hands. Right? Uh, right. And then I ask, do you think, anybody think I'm a prima donna? And everybody puts up their hands. <laughs> So, all right, why are you an inexpensive non-prima donna? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'm a prima donna. I <laughs> but I you're definitely not. No, I, I've no, I noticed actually during the period of, of our conversations researching the book, the thing that always upset you the most was when people thought you were over budget. Right. If somebody said, oh, his buildings are ugly, you would kind of shrug your shoulders and say, well, you know, you can't please everybody. If somebody would say your buildings are over budget, you would actually go apoplectic. Yes. Right. So, uh, <laughs> no, we're always on budget. The Disney Hall was two hundred and seven million dollars. Right. And that was the budget, and that's what we did it for. Right. Right. And and yet there is this myth that seems to follow it around of being over budget and being expensive. Yeah, but you know. The myth is partly promoted by the construction industry that would like to say that's way over budget because they filed a suit for change orders which they didn't get because mm -hmm. they thought they could get away with it, mm -hmm. but they didn't. Because they want it to be thought of as too difficult to build right. and therefore well, they, allows them to... The contractor said when asked by the client, what do you think? He said you couldn't build it. Mm -hmm. Well. Initially, uh, initially they did have trouble building it, right? I mean, I mean, it's a long, it's a it, it's a long saga that actually took two chapters in the book because it was started, all but abandoned, and then restarted. And okay, then built so with great I'm going to offend a lot of people. The, I'm going to Bernie Sanders, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> every institution, every wonderful cultural institution as a board of directors, and there's always one person that's a builder that knows everything. <laughs> and we, right. we had one. <laughs> on, in the first go around, right. we had one, and yeah. on the second go around, we had another one. Um, left to, the first guy, problematic, the second guy was a nice guy, but left to their own devices, this wouldn't be here. Right. One thing I learned in the book that surprised me about the Disney Hall is that you originally thought of it, it clad in stone. And that's... So why? Uh, and so why? Well, it's just very shiny okay. now. And I <laughs> wonder so, if you, do you um, look at it and, and... So in Bilbao, I did titanium because... Mm -hmm. Uh, titanium in, in cloudy skies turns golden. And so in Bilbao, where it's cloudy 50% of the time, I wanted that warmth of the golden. We couldn't afford it. It right. was twice the cost of any other metal. But we bid it as an alternate, and the Russians dumped titanium on the market that period and we got the titanium for the same price. Have you ever thought of becoming a commodities trader? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I might have done really well. <laughs> I'm really into this stuff. I, can't, I mean, it's part of the game. If you mm -hmm. don't understand that, all that stuff, uh -huh. you can't do things like this. Uh, so in, in LA, a concert hall is something you go to in the early evening. In the early evening, uh, a metal facade is hard to, to light. It's like a cheap refrigerator. You put a light on it, it looks like mm -hmm. terrible. Uh, and I wanted the softness of the stone, like this building we're in. It has, uh, it's a nice building in the evening. 
right. approach it. It's soft it, it, and yeah, it almost inviting. Below, the stone has a it's kind mellow of red, and mellow right, quality. Yeah, yeah. So I designed this in stone. Uh, in the first go around, the thing failed, not because of me, but because of something else. And then when they reopened... Failed, what, failed in what... Oh, I mean the building failed. Yeah, the, right, right. The, the building, process right, right. failed because somebody was a failure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, it came back. In the meantime, this was built. I mean... Uh, Bill, well, Bill Bow was Bill built. Bow was yeah, built. and actually the, the interrelationship between those buildings is incredibly important. I Bill think. Bow was yeah. built, and so the L.A. people realized that I knew what I was doing, right? And, and that, also... That the I mean, other people didn't, and, and they were blaming... And people those. in L.A., when, the, when it stopped for the first time, said, oh, you know, Frank Gehry's buildings are unbuildable. Right. They're expensive, they're impossible to build, you know, we don't need this trouble in our life. I went and, through a period right, where... And then this dinky two-bit town in Spain suddenly builds one, <laughs> and everybody says it's the most important building in the world, leaving the city fathers of L.A. somewhat embarrassed, I would say, right? Yeah. Yes. So, anyway. <laughs> okay, anyway, go on. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to parade my dirty laundry here today. <laughs> it's just... Uh, it's an interesting story, and it's, it's um, anyway, when they started this one, uh, it was five million dollars less to do it in metal mm -hmm. than stone, and everybody was bu very budget conscious, and so we did it in metal. The nice thing about doing it in metal was that it gave me a chance to revise some of the shapes. It had been d done in stone. It w I was locked into what it was mm -hmm. five years earlier, and by now I'd seen a lot of things I would like to change, which I wouldn't have been able to change. So I was, I was happy to change it, and um, it came in five million cheaper, and it's hard to light. It looks like a cheap refrigerator at night. <laughs> <laughs> Should I ask you what the road next door looks like, if this is a cheap refrigerator? Um, yeah, you're just yeah. no. for trouble. Right, that's it, right. Let's, not, let's not go there. All right, okay. No, it's uh, Eli's great guy. He's, <laughs> um, he means well. <laughs> <laughs> Let, Let's talk about other uh, large, large public buildings um, that you've done. Uh, what, there have been no other major museums since Bilbao until uh, Fondation Louis Vuitton in Paris, really. Right. Um, how did, how, what evolved from one to the next? I mean, the... the a lot yeah, of years. Uh, right, a lot of years. But, but Louis Vuitton, the, the great uh, curving forms become of glass now. Right. right? And so that's a whole other, other sphere of, of interest and exploration for you, is glass. Well, it was uh, when Bernard Arnault took me to the Jardin de Climatation and said, you're going to build a museum for me here, I really did start to cry because I knew that that children's garden is probably where Proust played. Mm -hmm. And it, I thought it, it, this was a very hallowed place. And, and um, there was a bowling alley on the site and that Dior owned. Not where, not where Proust went no, bowling, however. No. No. <laughs> on that site, right, right there. Right. And uh, the code said we could only build a piece, a building that replace that size, which would have been a block mm -hmm. about as high as this room, and that's it. Uh, uh, Mr. Arnaud wanted something else, so we went to the then mayor, Delo Delanoui, and talked about garden buildings, and I showed him that there was a precedent for building garden buildings, which we all know, the Paxton Palace, the Mm -hmm. in, in London and, and um, even the, the uh, Grand Palais and, and, mm -hmm. and that if we, it was very appropriate to build a glass building 
and that I showed them sketches and models of how something like that could 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 look. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we were given the go-ahead to build something of this height. Of course, you can't hang art on a glass wall, so we had to build a solid building inside. And so that there's it's the expensive building and that has two skins. Right. And there's a a, a void in the space between the solid and the glass, which I've always seen as a place for artists to to make things. And a lot of it is roof terraces and stuff, right? right? And yep. so, and I've talked to Jeff and others about the possibility mm -hmm. of doing work in there, and they seemed amenable. Uh, the first guy out of the box to do something is Daniel Buren, who, so the building doesn't look like this anymore. It's all stripes. <laughs> and Daniel really took it on. So if you go there now, it's blue and red and green stripes. On the glass. Yeah. Right, right. It's a Buren. It's totally, but. So and, that wasn't between the glass and the. No, no, he just structure. went. He just know, went right onto the glass. glass. But Daniel does that. He's kind of a. Now, this is very interesting because for all the accusations that have been made, whether justly or unjustly, that arch the architecture overwhelmed the art in many museums. With the Daniel Buren, we have a case of the, ar the art overwhelming the architecture, right? I mean, it, it, no, and I, I, it's... No, I fully engaged in, I was involved in mm -hmm. making that decision. I think it's... So you're okay with it? I'm fine. How long will it remain? Do you know? Well, I hope not forever, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, think, I think, actually, I think there's something admirable about not treating the building like it was some delicate hothouse orchid that you had to just tiptoe around and couldn't touch. Right. But the building is tough enough, so it can... Well, it has a life, take, you know, yeah, unless yeah. you let it breathe like that, I think it becomes a, a mm -hmm. dead, yeah. dead scene. Right. So I'm hoping other artists will come and put stuff in there. Right, right. Take it on. But, but all temporary. Ideally, yeah. Well, I'm okay. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Okay. I'm 87, so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I have a bit of a prepared question for both of you. Okay. Um, in Precarious, the book, that sounds ominous. No, no. no. <laughs> um, but it struck me that the book doesn't have an explicit theme, but there was a, a light motif maybe that had to do with resolving uh, conflicts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe undoing uh, opposites. Mm -hmm. And I just made a list of some of them at, in various points in the book. Paul says that, that you um, wanted to be both uh, avant-garde and popular, that you wanted to do both craft and art, that you wanted lightness and monumental weight, that you wanted to um, be very client-oriented, but also very personal in making form, that you uh, finally wanted to be an elder statesman and an enfant terrible. <laughs> no? Was I wrong? No, probably <laughs> right. Um, yeah. You know, the, in yourself, you can't, I can't tell you how I, who I am. I'm different. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, um, I want to be everything. That's, that was my point. Yeah. <laughs> that was exactly what I, what I was saying. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, you know, I mm -hmm. grew up in a complicated family. Uh, so like everybody, I need a, right. need a, a little bit of love. So, once in a while, but um, I think uh, I'm okay if I get it or if I don't, you know. I'm well, you've gotten enough of it, so I think you're no, you, you presumably should be no longer worried that you don't have it. Right. right? I mean, one, one, right. one would hope. Right. I'm, one would hope. One would hope. <laughs> <laughs> There's a... No, I, but I think there is a, a theme, you're right, that, that the book deals with, an implicit theme, that 
of wanting to kind of straddle differences and resolve things and, and modern, postmodern, modern, postmodern, monumental and yet uh, accessible and comforting, uh, intellectually uh, vigorous but uh, yet emotionally accessible at the same time. You know, th th those, a lot of those dualisms I think your work tries to transcend. There's another theme or recurring theme too, I think, which is the question of your getting involved in situations that uh, have the potential to be very positive, but deciding for one reason or another that it isn't working out exactly as you want or you can't control it and turning and walking away. Like the New York Times building a few years ago or very early in your career, the cardboard furniture company, the Easy Edges Furniture Company, um, I mean, that is a kind of been a theme of your life too, I suppose. Mm. Hmm. But painful. Painful. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, you get into relationships that look like they're not going to work out, and mm -hmm. rather than sit around and argue with people, mm -hmm. it's kind of nobody else is going to move. So, so you, I just right. move and get out of it. Right. right. Uh, I've, I haven't been successful at doing that with the Eisenhower Memorial. <laughs> yeah, we really have to go now. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing we haven't talked about, which is something important, I think, to this occasion even, is one of the reasons I got involved with the Abu Dhabi building, which may or may not be built, but... Uh, That's the Guggenheim for Abu Dhabi. And now is, is the idea that it was going to be uh, art from all over the world. So it was going to be a truly international art scene and bring in the, uh, the Middle Eastern artists. Right. When we started, there wasn't, very few of them were well known. Now there's mm -hmm. a lot of them in public view. But uh, at that, when we were starting Abu Dhabi, uh, African art was, uh, Johnny Pagazzi had just mm -hmm. had a mm -hmm. show, or just beginning to, uh, China was opening up, and now it's boom. So, uh, and I've gotten involved with the Devon Orchestra, which is the Israelis, Palestinians. Right. That's Daniel Barenboim's yeah. project. And so... For which you're doing a concert hall. Small, shift, right? yeah, yeah, we did a <laughs> gift hall to them. But I really believe that through... And the, this group obviously does, because that's what FAPE is about, right. is this idea that through the arts we can talk to each other, whereas through politics and other means we don't seem to be as... Right. As, as able to, to, to talk. Uh, Bert and I followed the Devon Orchestra on tour, and their Israeli-Palestinian kids playing Mozart together, rehearsing, doing the concert, spending the evening, drinking, dancing, talking, while at Gaza and in Jerusalem, all hell is breaking loose. And, uh, and they're getting calls from their families, and yet they're hanging together to play in concert. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the Israelis have actually gone to Ramallah to play with wow. the orchestra. So that, a glimmer of hope. Yeah. yeah. More than a glimmer, I would right. say, actually, when you hear a story like that. Yeah. So that's, that makes, for me, this award all the more one of my jobs is to uh, close the discussion, and that seems like a good, good one to end on, um, unless you have anything. Uh, no, it's further. a wonder, wonderful so. moment to end on. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.